Robert Moore had no trusted woman since childhood. His fault was his mother. His relationship with Gina were complicated and strained. She was an absolute tyrant in their family. Life with his mother cannot be called pleasant. She could not pull up with the manifestations of independence for her son. So she donned all the household chores on the shoulders of the guy. However, Robert did not like to do household chores and often, under the pleasurable pretext, neglected the tedious work. In addition, she did not stop her criticizing for a minute. Gina hated his long hair tucked out the nape of his neck in a ponytail, his sloppy dress, and even more unknown with his nightlife, gambling online or going to the city hotspots. Gina was a successful broker and made decent money, but Robert let it go to the wind. At the same time, he was not wasteful. He just sought to do everything to the determine of his mother. From childhood, she considered her son a worthless man, worthless and weak-willed. Not once in his life, she ever consulted with him. Of course, Robert was used to the luxuries his wife surrounded herself with, but she did it out of pure selfishness. So, everything in the house was arranged at her discretion, and she was used to having her orders obeyed immediately. The mansion was 15 minutes from the city, near a small picturesque river, surrounded by coniferous forests. Robert knew how to get aesthetic pleasure from communicating with nature, so he liked to walk around the neighborhood in the evenings. This habit was formed in her early childhood when his father lived with them, and Robert felt needed and loved. Now, Gina Moore was over 50, but still an exciting woman. She told his friends that she enjoyed the attention of men. This was true. Indeed, after the death of his father, Robert, she had a lot of men who pecked not only on her external attractiveness, but also other financial solvency. Robert was used to having strange men show up at their house and quickly disappear. He didn't even bother to memorize their names. Gina had told her son bluntly that she dreamed of him living an independent life and moving out on her, but her hopes had yet to be realized. Eventually, she gave him an ultimatum. If he stays living in the mansion, he goes to work for her at the firm. Robert had to agree. He spent more than two weeks in the office undergoing training. His mother kept a close eye on him, analyzing his gaps in knowledge, blunders, and mistakes in practice. However, to her surprise, the woman noticed that her son was rapidly advancing in the profession, had good sense, and developed analytical skills. And Gina is accustomed to extrading from any situation to its benefit. Therefore, she immediately put her son in a responsible position. Relations with his mother began to improve, but Robert couldn't bring himself to love her, to coexist with her all day long took a lot of courage and patience. Sometimes, Robert realized his strength was at its limit, so he went to a bar. There, the man dragged and came to complete insensibility. Once, returning to the office from such a bander, he walked along the square to the company building. There, a fountain was playing with water jets, and not far from it, on a bench, sat a girl. Passing by her, Robert heard quite sobs. Involuntarily, he turned around. The stranger was skinny and pale, not a gram of makeup, thin fingers of hands nervously bent over the handless of a textile bag. Big gray eyes full of tears attracted the man. Robert sat down beside him. Well, what are we crying about? He asked mockingly. The girl flinched. Moore expected her to answer him rudely to jump on and run away, but she turned to him and slapped her eyes frequently. You know, I'm grateful to you for asking me what I'm crying about. It has been a long time since I have been asked. No one I know cares. Everyone is in a hurry. They run away from their own and other people's problems. They don't want to empathize with their neighbors. 
as it's not their business. Somebody will say you should leave your words at home, but I have close friends. Almost no one to ease my soul. One grandmother. She won't say no. She will listen. But there are things I can tell her. I'm afraid of upsetting her. Robert looked at the girl with surprise, amazed that she was so hasty in the opening her soul to a stranger. He noticed the stranger was very modestly dressed and realized her income was pitiful. He did not feel sorry for the girl. Still, the situation was curious. So he did not interrupt her but listened attentively. You know, I came here from the village. I've been to all the offices looking for a job and been rejected everywhere. No experience. And my grandmother's pension is not good. She is a sick person, but she is not very well. Much money is spent on medicines and doctors and utilities must be paid. But I can help her at all. She brought me up, gave me everything, and leave for me. And I have no opportunity to thank her. I can't get a job, that's all. I have no strength left. I sit and cry. She sobbed deeply again. Robert looked at her more closely and thought he had never had such an unusual acquaintance. What is your education? He asked. High school. Robert scratched the back of his head, and a wild thought occurred to him. And he always said, I need a secretary here. Oh, and take me. I know the computer, exclaimed the girl with confidence. Well, you're in luck. I'm an employee of a brokerage firm, and I can help. You are literate in this respect. Yes, I study hard. He pretended to scrutinize his new acquaintance. Well, I will hire you if you want. The girl's eyes flashed with genuine interest. Really? You bet. I'm not going to deceive and experience it in naive girls. At those words, the stranger blushed thickly. I'm very grateful to you. You just saved me. Her eyes became moist again. Well, you don't get upset, sweetheart. What's your name? Iris. The girl smiled trustingly. Uh, but I have one condition, continued the man. Oh, whatever you want, promised the girl. And Robert went to the bank. He stood up and examined her from head to toe. She was not his type, of course. However, the girl's looks were pleasant. And the more he talked to her, the more attractive she seems to him. Iris had a lovely doll face, bottomless cornflower eyes, a graceful nose, beautiful lips. She had stopped crying and soft blush and charming round dimples appeared on her girlish cheeks. Robert scratched the back of his head and then adjusted the bell on his pants. Well, anyway, you will have to give me an intimate service right there in the office on the first day at work. After those words, Iris blinked her eyes a lot, and her eyebrows slow up in surprise. Is that necessary? Well, how do you want it to be? Everything in this life has to be paid for. As you said, you don't have any money, so we will take someone else's. Iris was perplexed and insulted and jumped up from the bench. But then, she pulled herself together and boldly looked Robert in the face. Please, give me the address, and I will come to apply for a job. I'll be there for sure. It's okay, and it's not going to cost me anything. But we will be able to provide for my grandmother and me. That's right. Your salary will be good, he said. Robert gave the address of the office and said goodbye to the girl. He was sure that she will change her mind not to come tomorrow. Looking at the man's receding feature. Iris felt awkward. How can she get to his place tomorrow? And why should she give herself to a stranger? She shrugged her shoulders. She had no choice, and her strain was running low. She was taken away by a lack of sustenance. She and her grandmother needed a piece of bread, and she needed an education to get a job in the village. So Iris had no qualms about the ordeal ahead of her. Of course, it was unpleasant for her because she had never had a man before, but she had no choice. 
You can see it on your grandmother's neck all the time. She had been thrown off. In the morning, Iris went to the brokerage office. What was Robert's surprise when he saw his acquaintance near his office yesterday? She had come in advance before it opened. How obligatory, he thought. What shall I do with her in terms of intimacy? Uh, why do I need her? It's silly. Well, she's young enough to be a wonder to me. Oh, hello, Iris. He turned to her. Honestly, I thought you wouldn't come. You'll be scared. But you showed up before the boss did. Good for you. But we will see how you do after you're settled in. Let's go. He took her under his arm and led her into the office. Robert felt her stiffen up as if she were made of wood. Relax, he said. I won't bide. Let's get registered, and by lunchtime, you will come to my office. Did you get it? The girl raised her trusting gray eyes at him and nodded silently. Robert noticed this time what beautiful, soft, ash-colored hair she had. When he first met her, it had been in a ponytail, but no, it fell loosely over her shoulders. It gave him a pleasing sensation. Under the cloud of sexual fantasy, he welcomed to his office and immersed himself in his work. In contrast to his frivolous attitude towards the female sex, the man went to work, collected and businesslike. He only broke away from her when Iris timidly put her pretty hand through the door. Frankly, he had forgotten about the girl. May I come in? She asked. Oh, you're just in time, he laughed. I'm starving. Since you came and we have a contract, let's do everything quickly and disperse. Have you done everything you need to do? Yes, the girl answered fearfully. Robert rose from his seat, went to the door, and turned the key into the lock. Hurry up. Show me what you can do. Iris started to undress slowly. A little while later, she slipped out of the boss business suit and froze by the door. There was a complete confusion in her mind. Her first man, she wondered. Her disgust for Robert was gone. Crimson as a tomato, she turned to her seat and tried to concentrate at her work. The next day, Robert walked through the reception area. He said hello to his regular receptionist. Tracy was a beautiful lady with a mind-blowing feature. Large breasts and rotted hips. Her hair, colored in various light shades, was gathered on her head in a tight ponytail. Her makeup was bright and professional. She sat near her computer, tapping her perfectly painted fingernails on the keyboard. He glanced toward Iris, who was also at her desk. When she met the chief's gaze, she shrank back and squirmed in her office chair. Robert thought the fragile girl was about to disappear into space. Hi, he greeted her casually. Congratulations on your first day at work. Yesterday was a trial balloon, after all. He smirked meaningfully, and the girl blushed thickly. If you have any questions, you can ask, Tracy. She's abroad her job. And you, he turned to the blondie, distribute the duties so that it's easier for her and you more difficult. You know, while she gets up to speed. Of course, Mr. Moore. I'll do my best. Well, she's a literal girl. She's a fast typist. I check it out. We've got a lot of work to do. So I will give it to her now and take care of the urgent business myself. Tracy, what a clever girl you are, Robert said admiringly. A satisfied smile spread across the blondie's face. The man entered his office and immediately forgot about both ladies. He plunged into work with his hat and often did not hear what was happening around him. When Robert Moore left his office in the evening, he found Iris alone in the waiting room. The girl was blushing thickly. I will write you a bonus, my dear, and you change your closet and do your hair and all your feminine things. Do I have to do that? Of course, or I will fire you for sure. Well, all right. Convinced, she agreed. I have an expensive company and my secretaries must be dressed accordingly. 
Don't blink your lovely eyes. I don't accept any objections. Get your dainty ass out of that chair. He licked his lips at those words. Let's go to the store. Iris had no choice but to agree. In the car, the chief possessed her again. In the store, he looked around satisfactorily and gave the employees the task of selecting her companion's closet. When Iris came out of the feeding room dressed in her new business attire, he gave her a thumbs up and said calmly, Well, that's just what I wanted. Just perfect. Now you look appropriate to your status. Thank you, he said to the girl attending them. Then he paid for the purchases and drove Iris to the apartment. He exited the car with a happy smile and thanked him for the purchases. Well, come on. Let's go already. It's late and there is a lot of work tomorrow. I did it not only for you, but also for me. Good night. He drove off, flashing his headlights for her. After driving for meters, Robert stops the car. He's surprised at his inner state. In him, he wakes up such a mischievous boy, as if he had been asleep for many years. The men realize that he liked those feelings. They were directly related to Iris. Communicating with her gave him great pleasure. Robert suddenly wanted to embrace this thing, defenseless girl, gently kiss her cheek and protect her from all the evils in this world. Her purity caused Robert's soul an extraordinary delight and faith in the best. Realizing that much in the wrong and softened, the man began to behave like a teenager in love. In the office, he was strict and harsh to Iris. In the evenings, he watched her from the window of his car. He laughed at himself because he had turned into some youthful bully with his money and status in life. He was in a state of limbo for about two months until Tracy brought him out into the open. Mr. Moore, she once addressed him, writing essential papers to sign. You break yourself all the time. Your attitude towards the new girl is apparent. It's readable by your behavior. The blondie smiled slyly. What is visible to everyone? Robert was frightened. Not everyone, but I immediately recognized the spark between a man and women. But there is already a flame between you two. Between us? The man dumbfounded. Are you saying she's too? You are such an experienced man in romantic affairs. And you don't see it? You are probably right. The man scratched the tip of his nose. That evening, he decided to talk to Iris alone. Listen, I want to spend time with you. He started at the end of the day. Yes, Robert, I'm ready. But do you need a shorthand? Iris put a notepad and a tape recorder in her bag. You don't understand. I want a personal relationship with you. Oh, we are already done everything. Done it. The girl waved her hands. No, I want a serious relationship. Robert was embarrassed. I don't know what will come of it, but it will be a curious experiment. Iris reasoned. The weekend is coming off. We can spend it outdoors. I want to go to one of those walking parks for ages. Would you like to join me? Robert asked. And he heard the coveted yes response. From the day on, Robert and Iris never parted. Their relationship grew stronger and stronger, and Robert decided to propose to the girl. But when he told his mother about it, she made a massive scandal. The poor girl, she said, had no place in their lives. And then he chickened out, and he acted low. Gina's threats of disinheritance worked. Robert took a leave of absence and fired Iris. Without even talking to the girl, he went traveling. There. He surrounded himself with a lot of tanned beauties and drunk and drunk wildly. When he returned, all his feelings for Iris seemed like a mirage. He was drawn back to debauchery and gambling. Robert thought he was done with Iris forever. However, the girl sneaked into the office when Robert was having a party with his co-workers and friends. She presented a pitiful sight. She was drenched in rain and miserable. Robert, Iris barely said. Where have you been? He came up to her and mocked her in front of everyone. Listen, you stupid country bumpkin. Get out of here. 
This is a social gathering. You don't belong here. Who let you in? You shall fire the guards. Robert, I'm pregnant. Irish blushed. I don't care about that. I don't know what kind of bastard you are carrying. Robert Morris swayed, and tied with a glass in his hand. Go away. Iris gave the man a confused look and walked away. Four years later, while applying for a job at the brokerage firm, this picture from the past surfaced in Robert's mind. All because Iris, beautiful, well-groomed and stylish, sat in the chair of the head of the company. How did you do it? He asked embarrassed. So Yudembas himself mentored and paid for a special training in advance. I took advantage of it. I have good potential and abilities. And besides, my father had a desire to make amends for abandoning me as a child to an arbitrary fate. I got an inheritance from him. I put it here. She nodded at her large office with panoramic windows. What do you need the job for? Robert strung back. Mother made us bankrupt. He spent it on another gigolo. And he squeezed every lost drop of us. You won't take me? Robert looked at the woman with understanding. She shook her head negatively. No. There was a pause in the air. I never started a family. I'm married. Children? A son. Is he mine? He's mine, Robert. You haven't forgotten him? Iris got up from the table and walked over to him. I'm happy, Robbie. Goodbye. Shrinking under her soft, enveloping gaze, the man left the office. When he went outside, it was raining. Soon, his suit and hair was soaking wet, but he paid no attention to it. Robert listened to himself, a frightening emptiness and a dreary feeling of loneliness were growing inside him.